In the dead of night, an average man awakens among a vast wilderness, stunned, trying to decipher how he ended up there. A jolt of memory suddenly strikes him, recalling the strange events leading to his current situation. This man was riding his scooter uphill when he encountered an unexpected hazard and unhitched vending machine tumbling from a truck. Breaking from the usual hit and run trope, he valiantly tries to rescue the machine but unfortunately, plummets down a cliff with it. He expected his life to terminate at that point, leaving him bewildered by his current state of consciousness. Desperately attempting to move, he finds himself frozen in place, which makes him panic. Calling out for assistance, he hears familiar phrases echo back to him, phrases intimately associated with vending machines, his unique passion. Utilizing the shining lake surface as a mirror, he is shocked to discover his transformation. His human form is no more, he has morphed into a vending machine, and hypothesis forms in his mind. Has he been reincarnated as a vending machine post his supposed death? He quickly dismisses this thought as illogical. Yet, gazing at his reflection, his new identity as a vending machine is undeniable, and to his surprise, he feels a sense of contentment. He admires his precise rectangular form and appropriately priced stock, appreciating their simplistic style and practicality. However, the bizarre nature of his predicament promptly snaps him back to reality. He examines his new capabilities, discovering his inventory consists solely of cold mineral water and warm corn soup, sold in yen. The system informs him of the opportunity to modify his stock, but it would require the use of points converted from money. These points facilitate his functionality, enabling him to refill his inventory, regulate the temperature of items, heat frozen food, and add hot water for instant meals. It also paves the way for new features. Thrilled at the prospect of vending all his favorite items, he promptly spends 10 points to switch water with cold milk, reducing his starting points to 990. The system enlightens him further, he can convert 100 yen into one point. Moreover, he discovers that his new form doesn't rely on electricity, instead, it uses points for energy at the rate of one point per hour. This means a daily consumption of 24 points just for basic functioning, equivalent to 2,400 yen a day. Not wanting to reduce his points, he realizes he must earn a steady income. He examines his surroundings, contemplating whether it would attract customers. As time passes with no customers in sight, anxiety begins to creep in, nurturing fears of possible shutdown. Abruptly, a gigantic frog garbed in armor emerges from the water, and it seems to perceive the vending machine as a threat. His system warns him of durability loss, a series of relentless attacks could result in complete breakdown and render him obsolete. Checking his stats, he finds that his durability is rated at 100, toughness at 10, but strength, speed, dexterity, and magic are all zeros. He speculates that as a vending machine, the other skills are redundant. Yet, the existence of magic in this world takes him by surprise. The system offers a solution for restoring durability, which involves spending points. Feeling relatively secure with over 900 points, he initially believes he could withstand this assault. However, the situation worsens as the frog summons more of its kind to join the attack. In response, he accesses a menu offering blessings, special abilities granted by a deity that can be obtained without spending points. He selects the barrier blessing, providing him with an invisible protective shield that only allows access to those he permits. This defense mechanism not only repels the attackers, but also makes him feel invincible. Unfortunately, his invincibility is short-lived as he realizes the barrier depletes his points when assaulted. The relentless frog attackers persist until dusk before retreating to the water. After the attack, the vending machine uses some of his points to mend his dented exterior, leaving him with just over 300 points. This reserve would last him for 10 days, but he realizes the urgency of attracting customers. For several days, he is left deserted until, out of the blue, a creature named Lamies emerges from the bushes. 
Thinking that there's danger nearby, she takes a defensive stance, but is relieved when she finds the vending machine. Lamies, exhausted and on the brink of starvation, laments her shortages as a hunter. When she finally notices the vending machine, her initial fear is replaced by curiosity. Upon the vending machine's greeting and request for coin insertion, Lamies inspects the machine, discovers its food offerings, and inserts a copper coin. However, the unfamiliar coin is rejected due to the system's requirement for a coin conversion function, which he quickly acquires. Though the pricing, 1,000 OA per item, surprises her, she willingly exchanges a whole silver coin for a warm soup due to her desperate hunger. Upon tasting the soup, she exclaims about its superior flavor compared to her usual food, filling the vending machine with satisfaction. Lamies goes on to purchase three more soups, milk tea, and water, spending a total of six silver and thirty copper coins. The total of 6,300 OA converts to 63 points for the vending machine. Spent and satisfied, Lamies falls asleep beside the vending machine which dutifully erects a protective barrier around her and disposes of the trash. When Lamies wakes up the following morning, she feels a sense of contentment despite her depleted funds. She thanks the vending machine, which replies with programmed phrases. From their exchange, she deduces the machine's consciousness, and they develop a communication system using his preset phrases. Lamies introduces herself formally and suggests a friend, Halami, who invents magical tools and might be interested in meeting the vending machine. With this agreed upon, the pair embark on a journey, Lamies astonishingly lifting the 500kg machine with ease. This feat of strength is explained by Lamies' might blessing. Along the journey, Lamies takes a break and prepares to buy some corn soup. Seeing it won't suffice for her hunger, the vending machine offers her some chips instead, which she finds delightful. He is overjoyed to recover more than 300 points and uses some to reduce the price of mineral water. After their journey, they arrive at a village where the inhabitants rejoice over Lamy's safe return. The focus then shifts to the vending machine. Lamy's explains that it is a magic tool with a consciousness she found by the lakeside. Though initially confused by the realization that they are in a dungeon despite the open sky, the vending machine takes comfort in the rule that whoever finds something in a level gains ownership of it. The stationed guards, albeit grumbling about the price, relish the food from his inventory, devouring everything available. Their enjoyment of the food prompts them to request a regular supply of the hot meals, offering a glimmer of optimism for his business prospects. Within the confines of the village, she moves with determination, garnering the attention of the residents. A disturbing scene in an alleyway draws her attention a young girl being harassed by a group of ruffians. Without a second thought, she intervenes, delivering a swift blow to one of the bullies. The unexpected interruption and the fury in her reprimands, despite not landing any physical blows, is enough to send the rest of the ruffians scampering away in fright. Satisfied with the result, she ensures the safety of the young girl, who is surprisingly unharmed but drawn to the talking vending machine. Her tasks in the village are not done, so she proceeds back to the local tavern, greeted with relief and joy by the tavern owner and Manami. While pleased to see her, they express their concern about yet another eccentric item from her travels, the vending machine. To assuage their worries, she recounts how the vending machine came to her rescue, positioning it at the tavern entrance. The prospect of her journey back to the surface world to present the vending machine to Halami is met with surprise, given her financial constraints. Sympathizing with her predicament, Manami suggests she take up work at the inn to accumulate the necessary funds. She speculates that the vending machine's contents might allure customers and, as time progresses, the items prove irresistible, flying off the shelves. The vending machine is relocated to the town gate each evening, providing the guards with a variety of snacks. Though they bemoan the repetitiveness of the flavors, the introduction of an expensive item, Odin, reels them back in, leaving them enamored with the new taste. The canned Odin becomes an instant hit, and its sales are bolstered by the onset of chillier weather.
During the day, the machine refrains from selling the canned Odin, in an effort to not encroach on Ian's restaurant business. Instead, he facilitates the attraction of more patrons. The girl Lamy's once defended shows up, displaying a streak of competitiveness as she takes offense when he initiates the greeting, leading her to toss a stone at him before storming off. As dusk falls, she carries the vending machine to the town gate once more. She hopes that, in the future, he will be able to communicate fully, hence her desire for Halami to meet him. She dubs him Boxo, a name he finds suitable. The day's events mark the beginning of what she anticipates to be a prosperous partnership. The next day, our hero Boxo is alarmed when he unexpectedly faces a bear. However, this bear turns out to be the leader of the Hunters Association. The director, as he is known, is impressed by Boxo and seeks their assistance. He reveals that they are planning an assault on the base, Lamis questions the logic behind including Boxo, who has no combat abilities. The director stresses that Boxo's knack for providing hot and ready-to-eat meals could be priceless for the hunters, assuring that they will be kept safe. Boxo thinks if they turn a blind eye to the frog monsters, the village might be in grave danger, so he agrees to participate. Three days later, they leave on their mission and it is learned that it is currently the frog's breeding season, causing an unusually large number of them. The director emphasizes the importance of protecting the transport circle in their village as it's the main route in and out of the dungeon. The local hunters, a group known as the Misfits, are also eager to join the raid, hoping to earn some extra coin. During a break in their trip, Lamis puts Boxo down. An interested hunter approaches Lamis and assures her there's nothing to worry about, as they are there to provide protection. Intrigued by Boxo, he asks Lamis how to operate him. The hunter decides to give it a try and selects a lemon tea. He appreciates the packaging and after taking a sip, finds it absolutely delicious, leaving him fascinated as to where it all comes from. Lamas explains that Boxo seems to have the capability of self-refilling. This sparks more interest in the man, leading him to summon his vice, Captain Felmina. To Boxo's surprise, the man is addressed as Captain Kelroy and turns out to be their boss. Kelroy, curious about Boxo, asks Felmina, a specialist in magical tools, if she has more insights about Boxo. Upon inspecting Boxo, Felmina senses no magic power and dismisses him as just a chunk of iron. Nevertheless, Kelroy is intrigued by how Boxo magically refills himself and wonders if the items are being sourced from another dimension. Felmina theorizes it could be a blessing, yet she deems it unlikely. While Kelroy considers it a mystery, he resolves to just be grateful for having Boxo around. The director then announces they will set camp for the night, which Boxo sees as his chance to shine. He becomes an instant hit as everyone lines up to make a purchase from him. Boxo has even added cup noodles to his offerings for this trip, which everyone finds mouth-watering. Boxo takes note of a girl with an unusually large appetite and Lamis befriends her. The girl introduces herself as Sway. Later in the evening, the director joins them and informs Lamis that the frog den is about three hours away. He gives her the option to either remain at the camp or join the hunters in battle. As a hunter herself, Lamis is comfortable with going but expresses concern for Boxo. However, Boxo reassures her that he is not bothered, leading them to agree on joining the battle as well. On the following day, they reach the frog's base, which is heavily engulfed in fog and they travel through mud. The director orders the attack, and the hunters start taking down the frogs. Kelroy motivates his team with the promise of extra pay for every kill, so they are all charged up. Lamis is eager to contribute her best, but Boxo expresses worry as she seems to be missing her targets. Suddenly, a frog jumps at her, but she effortlessly swats it away. She is surprised by her successful hit and realizes that carrying Boxo on her back has improved her balance. The Misfits team is also seen taking down the frogs, with Felmina using water magic to eliminate three at once. 
However, even more frogs appear and Kelroy is startled by their overwhelming numbers. It becomes evident that they are surrounded, which makes Boxo extremely anxious. The frogs launch an attack and Sway steps in to shield Lammies. Unexpectedly, a frog lunges at Sway. Lammies gears up to defend her, but Boxo's barrier repels the frog. The girls are baffled by the sight of the barrier, unsure of what just happened, but Boxo is relieved he was able to protect them. He spends a thousand points to acquire a new ability that enhances his field of view. Lammies asks him to cover her back and Kelroy compliments her strength, causing Lammies to blush. Boxo warns her of an imminent attack, but she is too distracted to hear him. So, he has to deploy his barrier again to repel the attack. Kelroy is surprised by the barrier and Lammies asserts it must be Boxo's power, which increases Kelroy's interest in him. However, Boxo feels he might be dangerous. They succeed in eliminating all the frogs and Kelroy instructs his team to harvest their tongues so they can get paid by the association. Thelmina urges him to help, describing the task as revolting, but Kelroy insists he became the captain so he wouldn't have to deal with such matters, causing his team to label him as despicable. As they contemplate their next move, Kelroy suggests they could assist on the front lines. Felmina reminds him their primary duty is to protect Lammies and Boxo. Kelroy, eager to earn more money, proposes giving everyone a bonus. Felmina suggests the decision should be up to Lammies. Kelroy pleads with Lammies to go and she happily agrees to assist the hunters on the front lines. They manage to eliminate more frogs, but a significant number of hunters are injured in the process. Lammies transports them to the wagon and Boxo considers how he could help. He comes up with an idea and decides to offer drinks to them for free. The hunters are appreciative of his generosity and the director expresses gratitude to Kelroy for their timely aid. The director mentions that the number of frogs was twice the expected count and Lammies questions how this could be possible. The director theorizes that this could mean the Frog King has surfaced and Boxo ponders on how powerful it could be. The director requests Kelroy's assistance to vanquish it and instructs Lammies to stay back to assist in treating and feeding the wounded hunters. Later in the night, Lammies is summoned to aid some of the other hunters, leaving Boxo alone. A dubious man approaches Boxo. Boxo realizes the man is after his money, so he offers him a free drink. As the man tries to grab it, Boxo scorches the man's hand with hot soup, causing him to laugh. However, the man prepares to smash him open. Just then, Lammies returns and manages to knock him out in the nick of time, leading to the man being restrained. Suddenly, there's a disturbance from afar and the Frog King appears. The hunters question its presence and they are thrown into a state of panic. Lammies loads Boxo onto the wagon, but the pigs are too frightened to move. Lammies decides to let them go. With determined resolve, Lammies attempts to tug the wagon using her own might. During the commotion, Boxo finds himself in a dilemma, worrying that his barrier won't suffice to safeguard everyone. He rakes his brain for a way to slow down the giant creature, browsing through his item list for possible solutions. Eventually, he purchases coke and a spark of motivation hits Lammies, she thinks Boxo might have a strategy in mind. Suddenly, Boxo undergoes a form change, transforming himself into a candy machine, now loaded with Mentos. Lammies is left puzzled, questioning what her next move should be. Communication becomes a challenge for Boxo, given his inability to verbalize his thoughts clearly. His repetitive statements urging for her to insert a coin only adds to her confusion. With the Frog King closing in, one of the hunters assumes Boxo might be malfunctioning. Nevertheless, Lammies having faith in Boxo, recognizes that he's trying his utmost. Boxo finds himself at a standstill, unable to make a move. Concurrently, the thief regains consciousness and, upon seeing the Frog King, demands his freedom, fearful of meeting his end. The hunters, however, silence him by stuffing his mouth with Mentos, which results in him choking. 
In an attempt to ease his condition, they give him some of the coke, leading to an unexpected explosion. This provides Lammies with an insight into Boxo's plan. She decrypts his strategy and explains it to the fellow hunters, who then utilize the coke to launch an attack on the Frog King's eyes. Just in the nick of time, both Kelroy and the director return, successfully striking the final blow on the Frog King. Triumphant, they all indulge in a round of cheer and the director extends his apology to Lammies for the risky situation he put her in. He commends Boxo for his crucial role in saving them all, proclaiming the mission to be a success. Boxo shares that his journey home was uneventful, but upon their arrival, they are met with a massive cloud of smoke enveloping the village. Despite the chaos, the director remains calm and composed. He apologizes, explaining that they must face another enemy. Lammies, filled with worry, bursts into tears, fearing for the safety of Manami and the others. Boxo understands Lammies' deep connection to Manami and tries to comfort her, but his limited dialogue options hinder him. Lammies, understanding Boxo's language, realizes that he wants her to check the village first before assuming the worst. Filled with hope, she heads towards the village to assess the situation. As Lammies and the group enter the village, they witness the devastating state of the houses. Lammies rushes towards the inn, hoping it remains intact. However, her hopes shatter as she discovers the inn in ruins. Desperate, Lammies calls out for Manami and Missus, but there is no response. Taking a deep breath, Lammies deduces that Manami and Missus must have evacuated to the Hunters Association. Determined, she sets off with Boxo to find out the cause of the trouble. Upon reaching the Hunters Association, Lammies reunites with her old associates, Karios and Gorth, who have already defeated the two-headed snake-like monster responsible for the village's destruction. Relieved, Karios assures Lammies that Manami and Missus are safe inside. Gorth talks about the well-protected transfer circle, deemed vital, by the director. Boxo realizes that the hunter's success against such a formidable creature is due to the dungeon-like environment, equipped with high-level defensive weapons. Lammies finally reunites with Manami and Missus, who warmly welcome her back after her long journey. Witnessing their joyous faces brings immense relief to Lammies and happiness to Boxo, despite his short time in the village. He realizes his growing affection for the villagers and his unwillingness to lose any of them, fueled by his previous near-death experience. To demonstrate his care, Boxo selflessly offers the villagers his food supplies for free, bringing them great joy and leading to a festive feast. As the villagers celebrate their victory over the frog fiend and the two-headed snake monster, Boxo cleverly points out that the snake monster is a natural enemy of the frog resulting in both parties' demise. However, Boxo becomes disgusted upon discovering that the villagers are cooking and consuming the monster meat. Despite this, he believes that providing free drinks during the feast will ultimately attract more customers and generate increased revenue. In a drunken state, Lammies approaches Boxo to share her day's events. She expresses happiness and observes how everyone gathers around Boxo. Touched by her pure-heartedness, Boxo bids her good night, understanding her genuine nature. The following day, merchants busily prepare their shops, and carpenters work to repair the damaged houses. Meanwhile, Lammies visits the, the director, likely to receive recognition for her assistance during the expedition. As Boxo ponders Lammies' potential reward, she approaches him and reveals that the director has assigned her the task of rubble removal. With her blessing of might, Lammies begins clearing the rubble, while Burial invites her to join his hunter's team and offers to take in Boxo as well. However, Lammies declines, prioritizing her assigned duty. A woman named Akawi, claiming to be from the exchange house, approaches Boxo with an offer to trade silver coins for his saved-up gold coins. Although tempted by the significant sum of money, Boxo rejects Akawi's offer due to the lack of exchange capabilities. Lammies comes to Akawi's aid and devises a plan to use one gold coin to purchase a cheap item, forcing Boxo to return the owed silver coins. 
The plan succeeds, and silver coins continuously pour from Boxo, filling Lammy's bag. Witnessing this, the previous thief, who tried to steal Boxo's earnings, becomes greedy once again, prompting him to hatch a new scheme. Following the coin exchange with Akawi, Boxo decides to incorporate a gambling function. This addition leads to a 30% increase in earnings. An old man becomes addicted to gambling, losing his own fortune while making Boxo the most money. His wife drags him away, promising to give him a good scolding. The director calls for Lammies and Boxo at the Hunters Association, expressing gratitude for their assistance. He privately requests Boxo's help in providing food to combat the upcoming famine resulting from the village's destruction. Bear introduces Shirley, who informs Boxo about the potential diseases accompanying the famine. To control both the population and diseases, Boxo transforms into a family planning machine, providing Shirley with a product that hinders reproduction. Recognizing the product's effectiveness in containing diseases and population growth, Shirley purchases a significant amount to distribute in the entertainment district. Lammies carries Boxo back to the inn, and a cunning girl named Swari attempts to provoke a fight by throwing rocks at Boxo. Sensing trouble, Boxo calls for assistance, and Swari is apprehended by her own guards. However, she remains resilient and returns for another confrontation. To defuse the situation, Boxo offers her a free mango juice, successfully winning her favor. Later that night, Lammies brings Boxo to the newly constructed hygiene center, created by Shirley. In response, Boxo transforms into a beauty product machine and provides Lammies with a product that enhances her skin's radiance. A fox and a female bear approach, also seeking beauty products from Boxo to attract potential mates. Boxo concludes his day with high sales success. The next day, the old man returns for another round of gambling, accompanied by his granddaughter, whom he hopes will bring him luck. After teaching her the lottery game rules, the girl wins with a combination of three sevens, presenting her grandfather with the prize, a simple bottle of soft drink. Although initially delighted, the old man quickly realizes that he wasted the entire day on a trivial pursuit. However, his granddaughter cherishes the time spent with him after a long absence. The old man finally recognizes the value of family and happily returns home, marking the end of Boxo's gambling business. The director discovers Boxo's ability to hide his presence and blend in with his surroundings. He asks for a favor, requesting Boxo to turn invisible to help identify the recent culprit responsible for numerous secret crimes in the village. However, before the task, the director wants to test Boxo's capabilities and takes him before the Hunters Association. Boxo successfully becomes invisible, aiming to pass the test. Meanwhile, Lammy searches for him and learns from Manami that the director borrowed Boxo for the day. Determined, Lammy's heads towards the Hunters Association after completing the rubble collection. After gathering the ruins of the houses, Lammies joyfully arrives at the Hunters Association, where she encounters Shirley. Curious about the, the director's whereabouts, Lammies informs Shirley that the director is currently occupied. Lammies wonders about Boxo's current activities after delivering the rubble. As she heads back, she encounters Swari along the way. Engaging in a conversation in front of the invisible Boxo, Lammy scolds Swari for her past mischiefs. Despite Swari's insults, Lammy's remains composed and advises her to stop being a brat. Swari persists, expressing her desire to buy Boxo. Aware of Swari's noble background, Lammy's understands the large offer she might present. However, Lammy's refuses to sell Boxo, explaining that he is not a mere tool, but a unique entity in this world. Undiscouraged, Swari attempts to undermine Lammies, suggesting that Boxo would prefer spending time with her due to her good looks. Lammies counters by claiming she is a lot more attractive than Swari, initiating a banter about who is more attractive. Ultimately, Swari gives up and shifts to a serious tone. She asks Lammies if she realizes that Boxo is more than just a magical tool. 
Lamy's admits her uncertainty, viewing Boxo as a human rather than a mere instrument. Boxo expresses gratitude for having such an understanding friend, and Lamy's thanks him as Swari departs. Bringing this episode to a close, feel free to comment if you're interested in following more of this exciting series. Thanks for your time, if you stayed until the end please like and subscribe for more amazing recaps.